Massive, unusual trade activity. That's something that's characterized the last couple of weeks in volume markets, and we've seen huge rallies come off it. But is everyone getting a little bit too bullish? Well, sentiment reports would say yes, and with markets breaking to new highs across the board, could this be part of a huge Wall Street trap that really has done a double fake so far? We've also seen queues and spy sectors starting to make new all-time highs as the tech industry comes through and semiconductors just went ballistic. But is there a way of us going through history and telling what the Fed tends to do next? Well, as it turns out, yes, there is. And in today's video, we'll be breaking down some of the biggest indicators that tell us whether a pivot is coming and more importantly, what to expect if a rate hike actually does occur. That and more as we cover stocks, commodities, and cryptos together for the week ahead. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the special weekend edition of the Markets Around the World. We'll be covering the macro, the lead indicators, and the hottest charts together. If you like anything to do with markets, remember to subscribe and smash that alert button. We will be live streaming, especially for the Monday Open as well, so make sure to join us there. The one-week performance wasn't so good on the markets. You can see it wasn't a sea of green, but the Friday was very strong. Almost everything was up across the board, and we started to see some big breadth come back into the markets, including the equal weight. But let's get into some history. Let's go through what we've seen over the last 18 months in terms of calls for a Fed pivot and potentially a Fed cut. So recently, we've just seen weaker jobs data, which is fueling bets on rate cuts. Basically, this is the big story at the moment. The curve is switching, although it switched a little bit more than you think on Friday, and we're seeing the markets love it. Banking crisis was another one of 2023 so far, and it shows you here that basically that was the last rate hike, at least bets. Now, were any of these previous ones correct? The answer is quite simply no, yet markets still rallied through a lot of them, and some were not as you know, good, I guess, in terms of what happened. Here are some studies of what has occurred in the last six pivots, and more importantly, in the last six to eight pivots, of what tends to happen first. First up, US 10-year yield. We've talked about how important this is, and we know that if the US 10-year yield starts to decline, it usually shows that we are on the last rate hike. Have we started to see the US 10-year decline? The answer is quite simply, yes, we have. Now, this is a pretty good read, and it's something that we've seen characterized quite a few times. Do we know how long it usually takes? Well, it takes usually a little while, three-month lead, three-month lead, four-month lead, and very similar periods of time. Here's a two-month lead in the most recent one in 2018. So while we have this read, can we also think about how the markets tend to react around it? Well, as it turns out, when you go through history, usually what we do is we get a correction before we get the full pivot going through. Then we move up possibly even to a new high. And then we tend to see a sell-off that actually occurs after the Fed start to cut. Remember, the Federal Reserve never cuts out of the goodness of their heart. They cut because something has become broken. And this is what we're looking for when it comes to the markets. Will we get something that says, oh, wait, there's something broken out there? Well, certainly Fed injections secretly behind closed doors are starting to say, yes, we probably do have something broken. We just don't know exactly what it is yet. Let us know if you have a bit of an inkling what is broken in the system. I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of opinions on this in the comments down below. So what's the average after a Fed rate cut? Well, it turns out it's negative 23.5%. I'm not sure if I expect that bad, but you can see here that there's around just under 200 days of potential sell-off in between where we see that kind of rate cut, actual market movement down, and then it moves back up. Here are some yield switches in terms of what's happened recently. We've got some of the most current dates up in terms of November and, of course, where this all started really, which was October of last month. And you can see there's big switches that have happened. We were looking at huge amounts of rate cuts. Now we're looking at less rate cuts, and this is a constantly evolving storyline. I feel like it switches every single week. So is the Fed done? Well, if the Fed has been done, then we've seen one month and three month returns, which are giving us that correction. Actually, that's pretty normal. That's pretty considered. And it's usually what you do tend to get. Then we get an actual rate cut. Now, somewhere between this point here, where we go from the actual rate pause to the rate cut, 
we tend to have some weird times. Remember, only 60% of the time are markets up over these particular periods. Then we tend to have a good 12 months. So what tends to happen is we actually get a sell-off into a rally after that. Now, the sell-offs, as we saw before, can be quite brutal. So it's something that we need to be aware of in 2024. And it really doesn't change much of our storyline moving through 2023, which could be that we're just continuing in a rally into maybe a Santa rally or something like that. Let's talk about NASDAQ High Low Logic Index. This is something that can be used as a bit of a contrarian indicator. It goes down into this zone down here, the green dotted line. Often that is a buy zone. We've seen some rallies coming off that. And we saw similar rallies happening in similar times over the last couple of years. So is this consistent with a nice little bit of a bull rally? Yes. Do we still want to see a pullback? Ideally, we would see a pullback. But what what, what really happened on Friday was almost surprising even to me. But sometimes that's going to happen even with your stats. Whether you have a 7 out of 10 roll and or anything like that, you're going to eventually take one or two losses. I mean, seven out of 10 stats, that's what's going to be. 70% of the time you might win, 30% of the time you might lose. We'll look at that later on. Here's some other things we shared over on our X account links in the description down below. And this one I think is fantastic for gold. It shows you that there is continuous buying coming back through into gold. We were net negative on the contracts. We went to net positive in similar times. We've already talked about it. It usually is like a plus 26 to plus 30% over the next coming months. And we're pulling back as we hoped we would with gold. So will we reach that 1920 line? We'll look at that later on today's video. Certainly something we'd like to see happen. Now, with all good rallies, especially if they're real, we usually want to see small caps come along. That is not something we've seen since the 2022 crash. In fact, small caps are horrendous. And it depends. This is a little bit of a different stat in terms of we're taking it from a different time. But small caps have done really, really poorly. Like they're like negative on the year. And that's something that you don't want to be seeing with recovery. You want, usually want to see small caps at least coming along with an equal weighted market or at least getting in there with the S&P 500. That is not what we're seeing at this stage. There were some positive signs the other day, which of course give us 100% normalized stat. And there are quite a lot of reads of these. And I think the most important thing is sometimes we see the markets actually go down for the Russell first, but then they end up rallying back up. And that actually happens quite a few times across the board. So with the Russell 2000 showing some weakness right now, could this actually be the best market sector to be in? Well, a lot of people are saying it's totally not because there are like 500 companies that don't make money in here. Yeah, I think some of those will die. But remember, the Russell 2000 is 2000 companies. It's going to be fairly resilient. Some will get kicked out. Some will replace it. That's the beautiful thing about indices. They're kind of like self-adjusting. But over the next 12 months, 25.6% was the average return in similar situations. And of course, this is showing us that there might be some recovery here. This was the big surprise. And of course, it probably got a lot of us excited about a Friday short off. And I don't blame you why. I mean, this is, this is a big stat change. 50% of people were bearish the week before. Of course, we were bullish on this one. And as of Tuesday this week, Tuesday, because remember, it actually isn't, it comes out later on, but it was as of Tuesday or Wednesday. We had 42.6% of people bullish suddenly. That's a switch of a monstrous amount. Almost half the bears dumped off and went to the bullish side. <laughs> and, uh, usually this means that we're setting up for some kind of Wall Street trap or pump fake uh, issue. So something we will be looking at, and we're going to have to look at really the structure for the week ahead on markets. Here's another way of just showing you the year to date in terms of the Qs versus the SPY versus the Russell and you can really see the underperformance of the Russell. Not a healthy economic gain. Now, another one of the great stats for the next couple of weeks is, of course, our move into treasuries or in terms of what we think treasuries should do. During November 6 to 26, we tend to see a weakening in yields. And this is pretty consistent over time. Only 10 times was it up, 30 times down. So in, it's like 75% odds. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it has to repeat that usually we see weakness in yields over this period. And that's something that's interesting. And the big bull case and something we've been talking about here in terms of bullishness over the next 12 months has to be these wage breadth thrusts. Now, we haven't usually seen a double one for a very long time and we, they're pretty rare. In fact, there was one here, one here, and one here. So we've got four reads on this. But when we get a double one, they do tend to be stronger than a weakness one. So that's why I'm saying 2024 could be so interesting in markets. 
Is this one living up to expectations? Well, yeah, quite simply it is. A puny pullback followed by melt-up. That's what tends to happen after you get these huge multi, multi, multi multi-day returns in terms of gains. I think we were on a day eight and then we saw a little bit of a pullback and then we've seen a new rally to a high. Are we naturally a (laughs) melt-up? History would say that that tends to be what happens. In fact, the percentages continue to increase and things tend to move up very slowly. And that's going to be frustrating, especially if you're looking for a pullback or you want to be a bear in this market. It's going to be really, really hard. In terms of November market performance of pre-market years, we are right smack bang on that point where we need to see weakness. This is it. I mean, this is pretty much it. The the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, somewhere around there in November is where we tend to see the peaking of the market for that middle month. Then we move into a Max Payne storyline, which we'll look at this week in video. So make sure to sub for that. And then we tend to have a nice rally into the end of the month. So if everything stays good and it has been pretty good for a while, that would be something that we'd like to see. Here's just that stat on oversold gold if you're interested. But let's move over to unusual activity. And I want to say this straight away. Big, big trades. Yeah, I mean huge, huge trades coming through treasuries. Number three and number one over the last couple of years. Huge positions coming back into treasuries. Now, I'm going to go with it's a pig. So that means that there is somebody that sees something that others don't. And remember, they can position for a long time. But very unusual to see such massive transactions down here. Could they be shorts? It's possible. I would guess they're probably not, though. So some massive trades down in treasuries at this point. Now, what could be short? Let's just have a look here. Let's go through a few massive ones that came through. Firstly, Soxel, Direction uh, Daily Sentiment conduct, uh, Semiconductor Bull 3X. We saw a massive dark pool transaction right at the close, right at the close. Then we saw here ProShares Ultra Triple Qs, big dark pool transaction right at the close. Now, they could be buys, sure, but I think they're probably TPs. Then we have TQQ, leveraged NASDAQ, dark pool transaction right at the close. And of course, we have this last one here, which is the Ultra Share Pro uh, S&P 500 dark pool transaction right at the close. Now, this is something that says, well, maybe it's a buy. Maybe someone was just positioning for the end of the week. But I could say, well, hey, it could be just some take profit coming through on these markets. And I think it's a pretty considered level. Let's move over to some options here in terms of what's going on. And first up, we have some massive, massive options coming in as well. It was a big day across the board, 42 million almost, 39.7. Remember, options volume is going up. And again, another session for the calls, 52% calls, 48% puts coming through. And when we look at the unusual 90-day volumes, you might be surprised here at some of the big places that happened. We had a huge stack of puts coming into the SPY, probably didn't help, Uh, whoever did that, damn it. Uh, But on top of that, we also have here the big trades coming through on the queues and the normal Russell kind of put overall. So some big trades, but realistically, it was just unusual across most things. Things like Wynn Resorts here with the big trade volume, 11.49, 5.8% down, probably off earnings. And then we had lots and lots and lots of those hyper stocks coming into the game again. Moderna, one that's interesting on the charts at this stage, Enphase Energy having a green day for the first time in a long time. And then, of course, we had the normal subjects. So check out that screen. Lots of unusual trade volumes, but big options coming across the board. Let's look at the last five days. Semiconductors 5.2, technology 4.52. So very strong from the two best sectors in the market. Communications next. And things like gold, clean energy, solar, anything that's really linked to yielding really made those huge switches towards the downside. If we look at the last 24 hours, yeah, it was big. Semiconductors, 4%. Oh, that's big. Huge semiconductor day, huge technology day. And we actually saw home builders also come back through, which is a positive sign for markets. So there wasn't anything in rotation that told us, oh, let's watch out, let's be scared. And that was a bit unfortunate for the bears. Let's move through markets now and the technical levels we should be looking at. We'll cover indices and single stocks just very soon. Advanced decline was improving. So again, that's kind of a bullish sign. PCC stuck in the middle, so we can't get anything from put call ratios at this stage. We're not in an extreme. Percentage of stocks above 20, 50, and 
at 200. It all looks pretty good still for the bulls. And of course, the skew market index was stuck in the middle of nowhere. We also have the move index, which if we bring that up as well, we're starting to see that decline, which is again, not bad. This is actually a good thing for bulls because we've seen similar declines in other rallies for the S&P 500. So it's not that we're negative on the S&P. Of course, we've been positive on it since that big Wall Street most heavily traded zone. However, at the same time, I still would like to see a pullback because it's nice to get pullbacks. It's a bit healthier than just a direct vertical up cliff, which uh, only you know hyper, hyper growth people like. I'm sure there's a few apes in the in the, in the chat down below that still love that type of thing. US 30-year, that was increasing a little bit. Remember, we talked about the US 10-year being a very important read. We want to see this thing moving towards new lows. If we get a new low underneath here, definitely set an alert down here, guys. Make sure we're aware of that. Then it's going to probably tell us that the Fed has hit its rate hiking kind of premium. And especially if it holds down there, remember the US 10, the US 20, 30, do predict the movement of what the Fed will do next. In fact, they're pretty good at doing that, as we saw before. Treasuries holding their own, huge transactions. I mean, this volume, whoo, the volume's big and huge transactions coming through. I like it as a base. I don't discount the fact to go to 85. I'm not actually a huge fan of trading treasuries. I've said that many times. It is more of a position-based maybe investment or swing move. Let's have a look at S&P versus injections. Now we're seeing the Federal Reserve and the rest of the central banks around the world kind of support the market with all of the tools in the back end. Of course, they say they're tightening, but you know, this chart says differently and it has been like that. They've actually done a great job of holding the markets at pretty much the same price while saying almost the same rhetoric for 18 months straight. High yield bonds, haven't looked at these in a while. Big improvement though over the last two weeks. And again, it's a good sign for markets. Another one you're wanting to look at is corporates. Did we see corporates improve? Well, yes, we did. So corporates have improved. And of course, that's a positive sign for markets. I'd still like to see pullbacks, but this is what we see. Equal weighted market, have we got a new high? No. Did we see an improvement through the Friday session? Quite simply, yes, we did. So we'll see what happens here. If equal weights start going down again, it's definitely not a good sign for the market breadth. If we look at Dow Jones transportation average, it was up on the session. Again, a relatively positive sign, looking for that to turn if it's going to go down. Home builders also up, again, a positive sign. We've talked about that before. And copper actually broke below this trend line here. So I'd like to see it recover over the next couple of sessions if we are to see further recovery through the metals lines. Now, if we actually have a look at iron ore just quickly here, and one second, we'll just get that up. So here's iron ore here. And we look at the contract, you'll notice iron ore is actually flying. So, you know, some strength coming back in. This is usually my favorite and I'm loving iron ore at this stage. And I've been talking a little bit about Vale and some other iron ore companies for a few weeks now, and they've been doing really nicely. Let's move over here to the dollar index. Yes, we saw a bit of selling. Long leg doji on the close. To put it in perspective of the weekly, you can see this huge trend line, and you can also see that big weekly close that happened down here. Now, for dollar bears, you're going to kind of be looking at this and saying, okay, cool, we've come to this supply. I would like to be bearish maybe, but unfortunately, I'm going to need to see it break through here. Now, there have been some big traps on markets recently, and I, I would say on the smaller time frames, been a little bit harder than the longer time frames to trade. And dollar index, we're looking for a break below that 105.24. So if that happens, we're going to see things like odd strength. Uh, we're going to see a lot of other currencies finding those buyers. Gold breaking down to 1938, almost hitting that weekly 20 moving average, which remember was a respected moving average. Respect, 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 respect. This is respect. And uh, because of that, around this area is really where you expect buyers to come back in for gold. And this is what we're looking at technically. Now, if we break down the daily, you can see here, we've got that demand as well. So we'll draw a little box between this demand area. And this is kind of where we expect markets to come back to. Now, we've talked about this on gold. I'd like to see some structure creation in here. It's too early to say that's there yet. Um, but certainly a good level coming in for that shiny metal. US oil, it's still pretty bad. Uh, there's some recovery signs. I mean, this is definitely one of those recovery bull kind of sessions because we get above here and we're starting to show a little bit of a turn, but 
yeah, only small time frames can really confirm that. So this was a little bit good uh, to get above that most traded zone number two. Pullbacks, I think, could be met by bull demand this week. And maybe we're a little oversold on oil. I mean, it's not just a little oversold. Look at that 20 moving average on the daily. I'd like to see kind of this happen. 20 hits it. Nice level of supply. Drop, base, drop, that kind of thing. Good level, of course, to look for reshorts. So, yeah, oil coming back up. Tesla, if you're a bull and you had those abilities to go into it, you actually end up getting your perfect gap fill here. And you saw a nice little rally, 2%. And I think the overall switch was more like 3 Let's just quickly mark this out here. Oh, sorry, 4.44%. So it was actually a bit better. So nice little rally off here. If you day traded that, I think not too bad at all. I would like to, of course, see a new high now, filling in the next gap, which is 243 so maybe if the markets keep improving, there are opportunities. Let's say the S&P, the Qs, they just keep going up and up and up. Well, there's Tesla, there's hyper growth stocks, there's the Russell 2000. You know, come from the abundance mindset. It's such a big key. There are always new opportunities, regardless of whether you think you missed the easiest one, such as an Apple or a Microsoft. And yeah, there's always another one. Financials didn't drop. That's kind of annoying. I would have liked to have seen financials drop off and then show us it. Uh, we didn't see a recovery in regional banks that was that big. So it was only up half a percent. So we're certainly looking for regional banks to show us the way there. Maybe more pullbacks to come. Aussie market hit down on the trend line. Didn't quite actually give us a switch like the rest of the market. Didn't get that new low. So we'll, uh, we'll mark out a new low here for Aussie market, but really it's only going to hit that if the US can do it. Let's move over to the internationals here quickly. We've got CQQ, the Chinese tech market, no new high, no new moves. And then we've got the US 2000. The Russell was weak, 0.67, terrible again. So, you know, the rest of the market, I think the NAS did 2% plus and this thing does this, it's terrible. I mean, NASDAQ on futures, 2.13%. The Russell's doing 0.67. That's really bad. So unfortunately, there's no really strong move on the Russell yet. We're not seeing the strength coming into the structure either. These could be false breaks on the Qs. Everyone sees this. And that's the unfortunate component. Once it hits, you know, that one, two, and then the third time. Third time's fine. Fourth time, everybody's calling for bears here. And we're getting the right signs for a pullback. We've got that huge sentiment towards the bull end. But you got to trap a lot of people. We did see one. Now we've seen potentially two. Big strong close though. So usually that means there's a little bit more rally to come when it closes like this than possible drop off. And we'll look at some of those key levels in just a second. In fact, let's do it right now. NASDAQ never gave us the proper turns. We did think there could be a seller here. If you did sell like a 15,300 and put a stop above the high, I don't blame you. I think it's a pretty fair go. Uh, for these markets, obviously, we didn't get under 15,066. But now, unfortunately, we're going to need to get through all of this range to give us a swing turn with the current information that we have. So, yeah, big breakout shows us that pullbacks should be met by bull demand. I mean, that's one positive about it if you're not already in the longs. But, uh, yeah, we just hit into these critical highs here. And basically, we're seeing a pretty strong market. I think it's at that top area, though. I think that maybe a little bit of pull that kind of thing, and then maybe we get something like this. And then that's what I kind of would like to see, a pullback through those November middle middle days, which is something we usually see in pre-election years. S&P 500, nice break above the weekly 20, which is a pretty big deal. Obviously, again, it's signaling that there's further bullishness to come if we do end up getting pullbacks. So I guess pullbacks will have to be met by bull demand. Hopefully not everybody's looking at this. If we do keep getting bull runs, though, I could say 45.20 is the next level for the SPY. So 45, yeah, 45.15 at the moment. 45.20 seems pretty likely if this thing's going to keep rallying up. Here are some levels. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room and then we'll go through the next one. So, of course, the elephant is expectations were that you would probably see a sell around that 43.75, 43.80. Did we see it? No. It was just bull, 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 absolute crush, yeah? We do have levels now, so at least we can mark those out. If the markets do move underneath those, we can say, okay, fool me once, and then, you know, usually you say, don't fool me twice. But in this case, I think what's probably going to occur is that this would be 
the final push for market trapping. So look, at this stage, you've got that kind of really nice upward trend to go against an upward trend to stop a freight train is really hard. We only had the temporary, you know, most weak kind of version of that. If this does end up weakening down here, you could start to argue that we've had some kind of Wyckoff where you've got that kind of preliminary rally and then you've got that BC kind of area, you've got a UT and then you're looking at a better pullback level. So that's something we'll be watching. But yeah, it closed near its highs. It kind of looks strong at this stage. Too early to tell. You'd have to use an option if you're looking for the short because it's just too dangerous to go for it straight away. Daily close, remember, it's above the others. At this stage, it's pushing towards that 545 12 narrative and you can see here on the spy it's the same thing 45 20 45 12 narrative so at this stage you'd say it's still bullish up and you haven't seen the change of trend until you see that you know that that last or first pull off here was just unfortunate very key level of course but everybody saw it i like the idea though even if this happened that would be really sweet it's actually very cool if that happens it's even better in terms of the setups all right, let's move over to the week ahead. Let's bring that all through. So, of course, we have a whole bunch of information coming out. And the big one's going to be Tuesday, which is, of course, the CPI number. Expect this one to really be the trapper now. We've got CPI. We will see most likely one move the wrong way, whether that's down or up, and that will trap some liquidity. And we're looking for the first move to hopefully be the false move and then trade off that. So, remember, it's better to be patient and react don't predict. When we keep scrolling down here, we've got some other stuff. Core PPI retail sales, again, will be important to the US and the markets around the world. And then we have unemployment claims on Thursday and a few other bits of information around the world. So it's really CPI week and retail sales week. Yes, there are earnings coming out, but we've really moved off that focus. I think we ended up about 67% positive for the earnings season. So that was beating expectations. That's actually smack bang on pretty much the average. So this earnings season has kind of met exactly the game. We know the markets are all in for it. We also know that we need to be watching US 10 and 20 year very heavily and we will continue to look for unusual trade volumes. Do remember though, huge trades came through Friday right at the close. Now they may be buys, sure, but if we see the right price action, we need to be aware of what's happening and don't expect it to be just initial remember it can be 24 or even 48 hours later that we start to see the reactions to those huge trades but there were quite a few and they were all through mostly leveraged etfs which is always a, a good sign all right thanks so much for watching if you enjoyed today's video make sure to subscribe smash that like button guys and we'll see you in the next video bye for now